What a pleasure to be here today as we are, you know, moving our way towards the holiday season. And this is a fantastic way to kind of herald the onset of the holiday season and to celebrate the end of a truly successful, wonderful semester at Northeastern. We are in a difficult time frame here with COVID and running our university, even in the midst of a global pandemic. But at Northeastern, we have managed. We have kept the university open this semester. Our students are on campus. We have kept them safe. They are learning in ways that are unusual, but very effective. And we are truly proud to be part of a university that has a better than anyone else COVID testing protocol and center that is the university that has invited all of its students back to campus. We are so proud that our research has continued even in the face of great difficulties. We look forward to a time when we can take fewer precautions and now we are thinking about the power of science that has given us in less than a year two viable vaccines against this virus that is the scourge of our planet right now. It is extraordinary how powerful science is that the techniques that our investigators use and many techniques that our investigators have developed have been used in developing the vaccines that are the ones that will keep us safe going forward. The power of science is something that is real. It's it's a phrase that I like, the power of science, but it's not a phrase that I use tritely. It's a real power. I personally have been fascinated by science since I was a small child. I just thought science, life, everything, how, how the world works is so fascinating. It is everything, how the world, how the universe works is just what we have, and it is fantastic. I also like to think about the languages of how we think about science. And, you know, I have a slide, I'm not going to share it with you here, but I have a slide that talks about great languages of the universe. The language that is the greatest in the universe, I think, is mathematics. Followed close second, I see, I see Professor Schulte smiling there. You like that one. Hey, Egon, yes, a thumbs up there. You know, close second with physics and chemistry. Those, I think, are the languages of the universe, the ones that we feel confident talking about, you know, as how things that are pervasive across every aspect of our cosmos and beyond. Mathematics, I would say, is the greatest of these. And if we think about, if we allow ourselves to think about, you know, whether there are other universes, which is a fascinating thought process, that is the language that I think we could be confident would translate between universes. So mathematics has my enormous respect. It is how we think about everything. It is how we understand how um, data is valuable, how data is analyzed. We understand almost everything in the context of mathematics. We also have investigators who use mathematics at a very high level to take their own scholarship forward and to move the scholarship in science forward. And Professor Paul Hand is one of those investigators. His research couples mathematics with life sciences in ways that are powerful and valuable and at the very forefront of our research effort. It is my great honor to have Professor Hand as a professor here at in the College of Science. He is an investigator on his way up. At this point, he is an assistant professor, but his future looks very, very bright, and we are honored and thrilled to have him as part of our Northeastern faculty. And it is my honor to introduce Professor Hand to you today so that he can tell us how he is using mathematics in ways that are moving our scientific effort forward. 
I want to, before I turn over to Professor Hand, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you joining us and how much I appreciate you considering supporting the College of Science. I will not show you our spreadsheet of our finances, but I can tell you that the way we run the college is as a not-for-profit. We run our finances so that we cover things and we can do new initiatives. We are always, always, and this is what science is like, we are always working hard to find the funds to support graduate students, to support undergraduate research, to support our junior faculty, to support the outstanding groundbreaking out of the box initiatives that move the power of science forward. The support that those of you have given us, those of you are considering is enormously appreciated by myself and by the members of our college. So we welcome you, you are part of the Northeastern landscape and we are just delighted to have you with us today for this seminar. And with that, Paul, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dean Siv. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here speaking to you all. And um, I look forward to, you know, to talking about some, some roles of artificial intelligence when it comes to scientific imaging and some opportunities that this has, but also some challenges that it presents. So why don't we, we start with sort of a, a simple, you know, a, a single problem from uh, from scientific imaging, in particular, uh, medical resonance imaging, so MRI. So this, this problem, you know, as you all probably know, there is a machine which you sit in, it collects some data, and then you get out an image uh, of, you know, of your insides. And this is a, a, a key problem uh, for medical diagnoses. Uh, and so understanding this technology is, is really important. Now, there's a fundamental mathematical challenge when it comes to getting good, accurate images out of MRI machines. And this is something that we can trace all the way back to high school mathematics, right? So if I want an image, and let's say my image has 100,000 pixels, so it has 100,000 unknowns, then how many measurements do I need to take? Well, we remember if I have three equations, if I have three unknowns, I need three equations. So if I have 100,000 unknowns, I need 100,000 equations. Now, unfortunately, each equation is given to us in the form of like physical sensors actually moving and detecting um, uh, what's there. And so simply put, it takes a long time to take a MRI image uh, because of the physical nature of the machine. Right, so if you've ever been in an MRI machine, it can be actually quite a harrowing experience. So it, when I was in grad school, I, I donated a MRI image of my heart uh, to a study where I was a, a postdoc in the cardiology department. And I was in this machine for uh, an hour and a half in order to get a three-dimensional model of the heart, uh, of my heart in particular. And What's challenging about this is like this technology, the imaging technology is slow and so you can't move, but you know, how do you tell your heart not to move, right? So this, this illustrates sort of the, the challenges of MRI and the need to get faster imaging, right? So there's, there's a trick to get faster imaging out of MRI machines and that is simply to measure less. Right? So instead of having 100,000 unknowns for 100,000 equations, uh, take fewer measurements. And so what you see in the middle of the screen right now is uh, something called uh, frequency space or Fourier space. And the intensity of those pixels tells you how much of this one you know, sinusoidal component is in the image. And you see there's all of these vertical stripes. And that's because the, the MRI machine doesn't actually take all of the measurements it could. It only takes some of the measurements. And so now we get a challenging mathematical problem. How do I fill in the unknown unmeasured values? Right, so this is the, the, the central task. I have fewer measurements than unknowns. How do I complete the unknowns? And the answer to this is to know something about the image that you're trying to recover. 
so there, you know, MRI is, is, is one of many interesting problems. So there like techniques that I'm talking about today will be useful in a variety of contexts. So on the, the right image here shows like electron microscopy. Right here, you want, might want to come up with three dimensional images of molecules. Uh, the top left image that shows seismic imaging where you might have, um, you, you might have sensors that are uh, attached to the ground and they detect vibrations that are reflections of you know, vibrations that you may have induced. And then the goal is to get an image of the substructure of the earth. And in the bottom left of this figure, you can see something called the cocktail party problem, which I know is kind of a, sounds like a quaint relic right now these days, but this problem is, you know, you have multiple sources of audio, multiple speakers talking in the background, and you want to disentangle what was said by one speaker and what was said by another. Right? So all these problems have the same nature. In a sense, you have fewer measurements than the number of unknowns in the system. And so you have to intelligently piece it together. Now, as a field, we've been able to do a, a pretty good job at this. So we've been able to exploit image structure to improve MRI quality, right? So this, this image on the left shows uh, you know, an MRI image uh, using a parallel imaging, which is a particular MRI technique. And then there was a, a set of ideas that applied mathematicians had come up with called compressed sensing, which when you apply these ideas to that same MRI data, you get a much cleaner image. And here, in fact, you can see this, this white arrow is pointing to this, this bile duct. Uh, and you can like, clearly resolve that duct in the right image, which used these applied mathematics techniques. And you can't really clearly see it in the left image. Right? So these, the distinctions between seeing these and not seeing these, like these are life and death distinctions uh, for certain patients. So it's, it's very important to get as high quality images as possible using as low data as possible. Now, as, uh, as uh, Dean Siv said, you know, so I am both a mathematician and a computer scientist, so I want to give you some of both of that in this talk. What's, what's shown on the screen here is uh, a, a fundamental set of image patches, right? So roughly the way that these advances in, in, in MRI that I showed on the last slide worked were they viewed images as combinations of patches, kind of like what's on the screen here, and said that many natural images actually have only very few of these patches. And so it's combinations of these. And in fact, this is how the JPEG uh, image compression standard works. Every eight by eight block of pixels uh, is represented by a couple of these squares that are on the screen right now, right? So in a sense, what we're getting at is what is a natural image? And the classical view of what makes some image natural and other images not is that that image is a combination of relatively few of patterns like these. Right. Now, um, mathematicians have then gone on and uh, further developed this and said, ah, but those aren't the only patterns. There are actually other patterns, something called wavelets. And, mathematicians have modeled images as having combinations of shapes just like the ones that are on the screen right now. So like this uh, top middle one, the, the Dobeshi's four wavelet, this is commonly used to represent images. And what's important about these wavelets is that they are designed by humans. And this is the interesting thing I want to pay attention to now, right? So we as humans went out and looked at a whole bunch of images of photographs or MRI images or you know, images of whatever. Uh, and then scientists like Ingrid Dobeshis uh, developed this shape, which happens to do a very good job of expressing and compressing images. And this is in fact the basis of the JPEG 2000 compression standard. Right. So, but at the end of the day, like human ingenuity got us these patterns. Now, I, I want to enter, you know, enter the scene uh, for artificial intelligence. So here is from the New York Times in early 2018, how an artificial intelligence cat and mouse game uh, generates believable fake photos. So the field of AI has gotten you know, good in many, many senses. One of those senses is it can now synthetically generate 
high resolution photorealistic images of humans, of like synthetic humans that have never existed. So here's, uh, here, here's a, a couple of images of this from, uh, from, from the work that was referenced in that New York Times article. These are all people that were created by machine. Uh, they, the, the machine was told to generate a human looking face uh, having studied a, a training data set. Right? And so what you can see is that in a sense like this computer model using something called a neural network, it really understands what makes a human face, right? You know, there are two eyes, there's a nose, there's a mouth, your hair, et cetera, skin. Um, and uh, actually one of the, one, one of the uh, things I do in addition to all of my research is, is running some you know, summer camps for uh, 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 eighth to 12th graders. And one of the games we play with them is we show them uh, these images and have them tell us which of them are real photographs and which of them are uh, made by computer AI. Uh, and of course, they're duly surprised that these were all made by uh, computer AI, right? So how did we get you know, to this point where we could create these realistic uh, images? And keep in mind, these images are even a few years old. So the technology has improved uh, beyond this uh, even more, right? Well, how the technology worked is there was a data set of faces that has been curated by you know, computer scientists, researchers. Uh, this data set includes a whole bunch of celebrities, right? So celebrities meaning you know famous people, often on the red carpet, often in you know in good lighting and sort of like a clear shot of their face. Uh, and so these neural nets were trained to look at this data set, and then they were told to generate something new that is similar to the things in this data set. And those were those images that you saw, um, that you saw before. And so if you're, if you're ever so inclined, you can go to YouTube and search for an hour of imaginary celebrities. And you can see uh, this, this endless uh, collection of synthetic people that, that smoothly deform from one into another, that smoothly change you know, between uh, face pose, uh, skin tone, um, with like hairstyle, gender, fluidly moves between all of these uh, these these attributes. Right? So this this isn't the only you know triumph of artificial intelligence. Uh, if we if we want to back up a few years, uh, one of the you know one of the key moments in the recent development of AI was the ability for uh, AI methods to detect what is in what what objects are in photographs. Right? And so there's this very famous challenge where uh, you have uh, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs that are all of generally a, a single object. And your goal is to identify what is the object. So for example, in the, the top uh, middle of this image is a birdhouse. And we see that this algorithm uh, correctly identifies it as a birdhouse. Um, we also see you know, in, in the bottom, like on the, the bottom middle right there, there's this dog. The, the algorithm in fact correctly identifies the breed of dog that's there. Right, so this development was quite impressive because the technology here eventually got uh, what one could argue uh, to be superhuman. Right? This, this algorithm was able to classify what's in these images better than humans. And this was quite a scientific triumph. And this was one of the things that led to the modern movement in artificial intelligence and in deep learning and in neural networks. Now, the, we, we, we can ask like, how are these methods working? And right? I think this is a very important thing to think about when we think about using them. Uh, and I wanna to go to this quote. This is actually a quote of, of, from me in an article that the, um, the, the, the Northeastern put out after I got a, a, a grant from the National Science Foundation. And this kind of summarizes the, the state of machine learning as it's used now, which is to say like part of the modern paradigm is that we don't want humans micromanaging what the machine is learning. Right? So oftentimes the computer may even do worse if we tell it what we think we know about the objects Instead, we just throw a bunch of data at it and say, you figure it out. 
So I, I wanna come back to this quote and reflect on it a little bit more at the end of this talk. But roughly speaking, this is how the field of AI and machine learning is working right now. You throw data at the system and tell it you, to extract the patterns and then make inferences from those patterns. Right? That's, that is the whole game. And this game has been incredibly successful relative to where these fields were decades before. Right? So before that, like humans would micromanage what they think was important. So I might say, here's an image. I think corners are very important object, parts of objects. In this shape of corners might lead to this you know, being a cat. Um, but then it just gets really complicated to explain like what is a cat based on corners and features of images. Right? So instead we just step back and say, all right, I'm just gonna show you millions of cats. You learn what is a cat. So we'll come back to this quote because I, there, there, there's much more to say about this, this paradigm. Um, and and to, to motivate, to motivate our, the modifications that we'll need to talk about, uh, here is an image, right? So this is a low resolution image. And hopefully you have a sense of who this is an image of. Now there's, there's a famous problem in imaging called super resolution where I hand you a low resolution image and I want you to hand me back the high resolution image. I mean, this is a staple even of science fiction magazines where, or, or science fiction movies where they go, oh, sharpen the image, you know, let's zoom in, uh, you know, whether you're on Star Trek or like Minority Report, um, like that technology is something that we as a society want. Um, there was a, a famous algorithm that came out in 2020 called Pulse and it worked on super resolution and it was given this image and let's see what its output was. Well, it was actually this white dude instead of uh, President Obama, right? And so this is, this is somewhat troublesome, right? So you and I as people could see that the left image is clearly of Obama uh, and this image on the right is clearly wrong, right? But nonetheless, this machine learning system, which was trained on much, much data, uh, thought that this was the uh, best output of the system. And so so this, this shows an inherent challenge that like when the computer is extracting patterns from data, it can extract patterns that maybe we didn't, we don't want it to, right? So here, and one of the arguments on why did this happen was because, well, white people are overrepresented in this training data set and, and people who are black are underrepresented. Right? So this shows us that we might, or well, we, we do have challenges that, that, that need to be addressed, particularly when it comes to bias. Um, bias can also happen in, 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 in other ways. So what I'm showing you are some, the images in the top row are photographs of, uh, or images of real people. And in the bottom row, uh, some of my students trained a, a neural network based on celebrity images, you know, which have a particular bias toward them. Uh, and then we're, we asked the net to come up with the closest image in, in sort of in our model to the images on the top. And so you can see like this leftmost image, the guy you know, loses his glasses and beard. Well, why is this? Because the photographs of celebrities don't tend to have glasses and they don't tend to have beards. You can see this, this woman uh, near the right, uh, she actually got a lot younger. And this is because the celebrities are typically young. And there are other things you can see, it doesn't like the turban, it doesn't like uh, other, other uh, features of variation of, of these images. Right. So, uh, so showing you images of people, you know, this, this is this, you know, it illustrates the point. Um, but I mean, I, I do want to tie this back to scientific imaging. So let's go back to MRI. And like, how does this bias problem manifest in MRI? Right. So we'll remember, the MRI problem is person is in machine, uh, data is collected, image of the knee in this case is produced. So these, the algorithms that are trained to do this, you might have a, a large collection of MRI samples of other people, and you throw that data at this neural network, 
And then you say, you find out the patterns and then give me what you think is the best, most likely uh, image given the data that I took. So this, uh, there, there's a challenge that happens here. Right? So on, on the left column here, there, there's a particular knee that is the true knee being imaged. And then on the bottom left, it shows a zoom in to this one part where uh, you can see at the end of the white arrow, there's this kind of like a lighter region that's like angled upwards uh, that's present. So in this, this is a clinically relevant part of the knee. So these four methods that are these other four columns, they're all trained to recover knee MRI images, but they all miss this pathology. Like all four of those methods are unable to see this problematic feature of that knee. So this is an example of bias, right? This, these methods have learned what MRI images look like. Like you can look at them yourself and be like, oh yeah, that looks like an MRI image. But somehow they haven't, like they, they haven't identified the actual thing that uh, was relevant in this case, right? So they erred toward creating a high likelihood knee as opposed to the knee of that actual person that was being imaged, right? So this, this illustrates you know, the challenge that not only are these images wrong, they don't look wrong, right? It's one thing to have artifacts, which then say, like if I have some pixels that are really blurry, a doctor will know, oh, well, this is blurry. I can't trust it that much. Whereas here, that doesn't do that. It just completely removes it. So in a sense, it's so smart that it filled in what it thinks that part of the knee is, even though it's not right. So that is, that is a challenge. Um, so, so I do want to hit at you know, some of the things that we can do to, you know, to deal with this issue of, of, of bias from learning from data, right? And so, so here's, here's a, fun, a fun experiment. Uh, so let's say I share with you a bunch of photos of celebrities and uh, all those celebrities happen to be human. And uh, I then give you this photo of uh, Shrek and then I remove Shrek's nose. And then I say, please fill in the missing pixels. So keep in mind, the only thing you know is here are examples of human faces. And now I'm giving you an ogre face telling you to fill it in. So this is a perfect illustration of the, the challenges of dealing with bias. So on one hand, do I want my answer to be biased? Yes, I want it to learn from this data. I want it to know that faces have noses. But do I want it to be biased toward human skin tones? Well, no, because the ogre is clearly green, right? So in that sense, like I both like bias and I both don't like bias. And this is sort of the central conundrum. Um, so I, I worked on, on this problem with uh, uh, some collaborators in Pakistan, uh, one of my graduate students and actually a, a very talented undergraduate at Northeastern named Max Daniels. Uh, who is one of the most impressive researchers I've met even as he was a sophomore in college. Uh, and we looked at this problem and here's what the algorithm that we trained came up with. Right? So it filled in the nose. Um, it, gave it, it gave Shrek kind of a human nose, but it did give him a green nose. Right? So you can see that's somewhat reasonable. Like it learned this consistency of skin tone but it also learned that the shape of human noses uh, and, and applied it here, right? So this, this is based on some of my research, which really tries to solve the problem of data bias by maintaining probability distributions over all possible images to make sure that every possible outcome is accounted for. And then you can choose the likeliest one instead of prematurely disregarding some. Um, I want to talk about a, another type of research, uh, you know, direction that, that that I've looked at, and so here are you know, back to some knee MRI images. These images were made by a, cl a collaborator of mine, uh, Dr. Reinhard Heckel, who's a professor in Munich. Um, and what what's interesting about these images is it shows different categories of methods of solving this this knee uh, MRI problem, right? So the the rightmost category is a trained neural network where you look at uh, 
thousands and thousands of knee MRI images and you learn their patterns. The second from the right column labeled classical, those were the techniques that I started this talk off with, like ideas like sparsity and patterns. And um, basically the, these are the ideas of the last like 20 years. Um, and then uh, this, this second column from the left, this is something called an untrained neural network. This is a network which was not shown any data at all. And this is kind of surprising because the image quality that it produces is uh, at least as good and in some cases better than the classical methods and these trained methods, um, at least in this experiment. Of course, you can develop the technology in all these cases. All right, so so my, my comment here is when we think about how do we deal with the challenge of bias in training data, one answer is to simply not have training data. If you don't have it, you aren't going to be biased by the ways that it was collected. And what, we, what we've shown in, in the work that, uh, sort of the introductory work, which this is follow-up work by Professor Heckel, uh, is that that method uh, can be uh, competitive. So I want to come back to, you know, so and conclude on, with some like reflective thoughts on this, this comment. Right? So this, this idea that in artificial intelligence right now, we're largely throwing data at algorithms and telling the algorithms, you figure out the patterns and then give back to us your best estimate of whatever the world. I think this, this paradigm needs some revision, right? If we think like, suppose we have a data set uh, you know, of, of humans where, where maybe we have, uh, we have certain categories of humans that are, or certain categories of people that are overrepresented or underrepresented in, in the data set. Then when we build our algorithms, we, we typically try to optimize for overall performance on the data set. So if my data set you know, overrepresents some people over others, then successfully recovering images of those people is going to be weighted higher than rec successfully recovering images of other people. And this is a trade-off that you know, is, is something that is often done implicitly and often not something that is really like given to an end user of the systems to actually um, modify for their needs of their populations. And so I think we're, we're we're starting to enter a new era where we can't simply just give data to these algorithms and tell it to hand us the best, uh, the best result. We want the algorithms to actually be able to pay attention to, well, maybe like this class of knee images, I want to care about a lot. And this other class of knee images, I might want to care about less. Right, so errors of this nature on this data set and er errors of that nature on that data set aren't all equal. And so, so we need to get to a place where, uh, where we pay attention to, to the bias in the data sets, to the amount that each of those biases are removed in certain, um, in certain circumstances. All right, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And thank you for, for listening. I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Oh, thank you so much. That is just fascinating work. Um, <laughs> I personally have a lot of questions and I'm sure that our um, audience does as well. So let's just see what we have um, down here. Um, there's a question about the Shrek image, which was so interesting with regard to, you know, the biases that you raise which itself, the notion of bias, I think, is just so deeply profound in terms of machine learning and AI. But here's a, a question um, regarding the Shrek image. If we move the human faces to different positions or rotate them, so the nose is not always in the center, will it change the outcome? Uh, so, so yeah, so that's, that, that, that's a good question. Um, Generally speaking, what, what matters is that the, the task that you try to do at what we'll call test time is represented by the data that you present it. So if you only present square headshots and I give you a square headshot, then you, you should succeed. Um, 
if you only present me square headshots and I give you a rotated head, you should fail. But if I give you a whole variety of heads in lots of different positions, and then I give you a square headshot, you should succeed. And so the, the rough rule of thumb is we can basically learn anything as long as you give me enough data to appropriately cover the full problem of interest. Thank you, good. So let's see, there are a number of, a number of questions um, here. Um, I, I'd like to actually just throw out one of my own to you. I loved your notion of a natural image. I'm a life scientist and I, for me, natural has a certain connotation, but I'm not quite sure how you were defining this. What would you, can you define for us what you mean by a natural image? Yeah, so, so if, if we go back to the, this fundamental mathematical conundrum, like I have uh, 100,000 equations uh, or 100,000 unknowns, but I don't have 100,000 equations, right? So, uh, so if I'm gonna pull out my basic linear algebra, which I studied in college, Right, so then I know there's, this, there's an infinite number of images that are consistent with those equations, with the measurements that I got. And if I look at a typical one of those images, it looks like static. And so what the whole th game here is, how do I distinguish the image that I'm looking for from something that looks like static? So then the, the term we use for this is, we, we talk about something called the manifold hypothesis. So which is the set of images that I am interested in forms some, you know, some surface in this like 100,000 dimensional space. And that set is what we would call sort of the, the set of natural images. So in the case of MRI, natural images would be any image that you or I would identify as that is an MRI image. But if I'm in consumer photography, then a natural image would be so anything that could plausibly be a photograph of the real world. So here, naturalness is it, it, tied deeply toward the application, that if it's a feasible output of the system you're looking for, then that's natural. So now the mathematician in me goes, oh, but this isn't a mathematical definition of natural. Uh, and that is in fact quite a challenge because if you're a mathematician in this field, and you're trying to prove things about these methods, and I have some papers that really are trying to like do theory on these problems, then, I mean, you can't prove math about non-mathematical objects. So then a lot of the challenge is how do you even mathematically define what a natural image is? And there you need to choose particular models that then you, know, then you can critique and analyze those models. And that then gets quite technical. Oh, you're muted, Doc. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, that is a much more complicated answer than I appreciated. Really fantastic. Let's go to um, a question from Diana. How are deep fake, deep fake photos different from really good Photoshop? Is there a difference there, or are we, you know, in the same? realm yes. and is this splitting hairs in terms of what deep fake actually means? I, I think this is a, a fascinating question, right? So to, to, the, to those in the audience who might not know, right, a, a deep fake is basically like an image or a video that is created, you know, by an AI algorithm that goes, that, that where, you, where it can look like someone is saying something they never said or someone is in a position they never were in. Um, so it's a realistic looking uh, image. Uh, mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, this has significant political ramifications, uh, particularly when it comes to, can you trust this image? Um, now to the question, is this all that different from Photoshop? I will, in a sense, no, but really I think the answer is yes. So, so the sense that it is the same as Photoshop is yes. It, if you have a really skilled person with Photoshop, you could create an image that looks like this person was in this scene and it might be very hard to detect. And I think that that is not what is so new or so difficult about deep fakes. The, the challenge with deep fakes is that they are now produced automatically. 
And so you can produce frame by frame of fake images that are consistent and with even fake voices. And so you can create video of people saying things that they never said. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a problem because culturally, we, we know that images can be Photoshopped, right? We know that that image isn't trustworthy, but generally speaking, when we have a video, video is as good as fact. Now, of course, we know that even that is problematic um, because you know, videos can be edited in order to distort meaning. And you know, we saw this in the political sphere you know, over the last few years. So the actual impacts of the deepfake technology are things that have been around for a while. It's just that it's kind of democratized the ability to make them and it's significantly lowered the cost of making them. And that's, that's the real challenge. Um, good. So, so like to, you know, encourage everyone to ask the questions on their mind. As I said, I have a zillion here and I know those of you who are parents and alumni and um, um, sitting and friends who are listening to Professor Hand here, this is a very complex, um, very complex conversation. I think we are exposed to AI and machine learning every day aren't we, with our cell phones learning when we wake up in the morning so they can finish charging if we happen to leave them plugged in overnight, for example. It's like constant, I think. And the question I think is for all of us, you know, what actually, how, do, how does machine learning and AI impact our lives? Let's go to a couple more. I think your question about the MRI is something that um, would be interesting to pursue. But let us um, go to some fascinating questions here. Can other disciplines help play a role related to the issue of bias? And then, you know, as a related um, a corollary to that, as images available become increasingly more diverse. Will this improve bias without changes to the current prevailing algorithms? The apropos, the uh, very interesting example you showed us of the low res image of President Obama being interpreted in a completely different way. Do you want me to repeat some of that? Yeah, yeah. Can we, can we do one at a time, please? Yes, we can. Although they're related, you'll see yes, my yes. enthusiasm got, a, got away with me there, um, Paul. So can other disciplines help play a role related to the issue of bias was the first part of so, the question. So yes, I, I, I think that it can, uh, it, it can and, it, and they must, right? So there, you know, there, of course, there are scholars in a whole variety of fields, particularly in you know, uh, humanities oriented fields who have paid attention to inequity uh, and, you know, and to racism and to like these challenges from, from like a humanistic perspective. And I think one, you know, so I, while I am not an expert in, you know, in those fields, like one of the basic lessons is the difference between equality and equity. And so roughly speaking, equality is that you do exactly the same thing to all of the people. And then equity is you create a system where, where everyone can like achieve the needs, you know, the, the, their goal meet their needs even if it requires different treatments right so i think the way computer scientists uh, the field of computer science is structured right now it it really believes in equality right you're optimizing performance on a data set where you ask how many of my thousand test images did i get wrong and i don't care whether that's an image of a white person or a black person one wrong image is one wrong image Right, so instead we need to move to a more equity-based perspective, which is how well are we doing on images of white people? How well are we doing on images of black people? I mean, and of course other categories of people as well. Is it like, if we had a 1% better performance on, on uh, like white people, the current method might weigh that as a certain level versus that might accept a slightly worse performance on black people because the data set over represents white people, mm -hmm. right? So we need to get to this perspective where we, we need this level of performance on all of the data set subgroups. And so this is something which I do think the field is learning from these other areas of just perspectives. Uh, now, I think the field should move more quickly in this direction. 
so so that is um, a very interesting answer. And then there, the corollary to this one um, that you've just answered were, is as images available become increasingly more diverse, will this improve bias without changing the current prevailing algorithms? I, 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 th this is a wonderful question. So the fact that there are more images does not address the bias concern, because what matters is the, the distribution of those images. Right? Like if, if we're collecting images in the same way and we just get 10 times more images, the, the, the class imbalance is going to continue to persist. Right? And so then right now th there's a sense in which, you know, like I like to say, many computer scientists are, are, are lazy in some senses. Right? If you wanna go collect, get a data set to train your image you know, to in paint Shrek's nose, well, what are you gonna do? Go scrape the internet and get a whole bunch, you can get, an infinity of images. But the images that are on the internet are themselves biased by human, you know, human behavior. So I think like systems have to start paying attention to the, the, the subgroups and balancing these classes um, and, and just not throw your hands up and say, because I didn't do the data collection, the data is fine. Okay. Um, thank you. That is a complex, wonderful question. Here's another one um, for you, Paul. If AI gen an AI generated image is no more indexed to reality, how can you be sure that it gives a real depiction of reality? I, I think that is the, the answer is you can't. I mean, so, so now, I, I mean, the, 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 this gets at, uh, or, I mean, and, and maybe I want to, I, I, I can zoom in a little bit on some like scientifically useful perspectives of this question. So, so the, you know, I showed some slides about like synthetically generated faces. And of course you could make synthetically generated sort of data from a whole bunch of data classes. This is actually very scientifically useful in certain problems. Like let's say you're building a robot and you want the, to have the robot learn how to, you know, uh, manipulate objects in, in the real world. Well, when you're training this robot, real world experience might be expensive, right? So if you could have computers synthetically generate, here's what the robot would see if it did all of these actions, right? So then, then you could get a lot more data to train that robot to juggle or you know, do whatever the things that we're training the robots to do. Right, so, so there, the, the ability to create that synthetic data is actually very scientifically uh, important. Uh, now, of course, like if we apply this to the, the, the social and political setting, then you know, it's of course important there as well. Very interesting. Um, we have a few more minutes, so please do add your questions. Remember there are, you know, we're all, we're all an, not so expert in this, including in myself. So anything you would like to ask, I know Professor Hand will be happy to have a go at. Um, you know, one thing I I'm, was curious about was your um, MRI series of the knee. And the question is, you know, where in medical technology now is AI being used to help, for example, a radiologist interpret your MRI scan? Is there now, are there now um, algorithms that are working, you know, where there are programs working with physicians to interpret MRIs? And if so, shouldn't the patient know? Because, you know, what you showed us was a little alarming there, and we would not want to trust. Um, you know, AI in that instance? Well, I, I mean, I think there are, like, like this is definitely a, a complicated issue, right? So one issue, is, like the, the basic premise of, you know, the talk that I was giving as it relates to MRI is you could store, you, you could record less data and make up for it with intelligent algorithms. Mm -hmm. So if the algorithms aren't good enough, then we're going to accept the status quo of the world that is now, and this is how long an MRI image takes. So the opportunity here is if we could speed up MRI, if we could speed it up 4x or 8x, then 
uh, each scan will take less time, the scans will be less noisy, the costs will be lower, MRI deployment around the world could be higher, right? Because let's remember that most of the world is not near an MRI machine at all. So, I mean, there, there, it's important to remember all these things. If, mm -hmm. if an automated algorithm can do diagnoses, then doctors will be able to manage the successful diagnosis of orders of magnitude more um, patients than they can now. So, so it's, it, it, I mean, the, the, the full trade-off is really hard to wrap your head around. But of course, we do want the diagnoses to be correct, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and and so the so so yeah, oh, sorry. Can we go back to the question again? Because I I was giving a background. Um, That's right. The the question really, I think, for all of us who have medical procedures and then get results from a physician is the knowledge that we might not have as to how the physician has been assisted mm -hmm. by technology that would include AI. And, yeah. you know, when sh should we ask? Would the physician even know? You know, how, what is the present landscape um, that would be informative to us yeah. as patients? All right, so, I, I mean, the, so the technology is such that new, new MRI machines are starting to use um, technology of this, of this nature. And it is viewed as sort of the future of, the, of MRI imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so the, these ideas are coming and they are here, you know, they are, they are being perfected. Now, the question of should the patient know that the, the doctor is using you know, is using an image for that was assisted by AI. I think that this is a question which is best addressed by agencies that um, would approve this medical process. Mm -hmm. right, so if you go create an MRI machine, I think, I, I, I believe you need to get, um, you need to get approved by the FDA. And that approval is based on the confidence that the machine is, um, is accurate, right? So I, I believe that individual, individual patients shouldn't be burdened with the exact source of the, 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 the medical image that was gotten to them. What they should do is they should put their trust in the FDA and the FDA should use that trust mm -hmm. responsibly to evaluate these machines. And if that means that the, the, the algorithms are not good enough, then that means you should not be using them. Right. And so, and I kind of want to draw it. Um, well, well anyway, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Like this, this is why we have approval agencies. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, other questions from any of you who are, we're so happy to have you with us and any questions you have, please, in these last few minutes, you are very welcome. Um, Here's a question about ethicists. Do you see ethicists having a role in your research? Um, so I, I, I very much uh, think they should have a role in, like in, in the field of artificial intelligence research. Um, that said, I, you know, I don't know exactly how that role is going to manifest. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, you know, what does it mean to do research in computer science that, uh, and in AI, what, you know, regardless of the field you're applying your AI to, it largely means there is some data set, which is commonly accepted, which then you use, and then you test your algorithm on how, what level of performance it attains on that data set. And if your level of performance is higher than the other, you know, group's level of performance, then your method is better. And so like this, this is the, something is called a common task framework. This is the, like the philosophical foundation of computer scientists, computer science research right now. The, the challenge from individual researcher side is if I were to go and use a different data set than everyone else, now I open myself up to a critique of, well, why are you not using the standardly accepted data set? Right, like I then, like it, it, it now looks like something fishy might be happening. 
right? And so if you try to change any of these individual like pieces, you get you run into you run into like challenges. Uh, and so I feel like like the role of like ethicists, ethicists, and like other disciplines can help just like help us think about the, this whole pipeline and like what where where we do need to you know bring in external consideration um and if, if we you know the, the canonical example of where like ethicists are you know would most used in, in say ai right now is probably like in self-driving cars mm -hmm. right the, the classic example of suppose the car had to decide between this catastrophic event for this number of people and that catastrophic event for that other number of people right so in that case there's like very very objectively, like someone needs to make that decision. And it's probably not the person who spent their whole life training neural network algorithms and trying to get them to converge and get them to, you know, behave in a stable way. Like that really should be made by people who can, are experts at weighing human needs and interests. Thank you so much. You know that this is really fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul, for this talk. You know, I think that I actually messed up. I'm looking at Professor Egon Schulte, who is the chair of our math department. And I think that you were supposed to introduce Professor Hand. And in my enthusiasm for math as the language of the universe, I kind of went right there. So in our last minute or so, I'd like to invite you, um, Egon, to say a few words to the group here. And I apologize for or, you know, forgetting. No problem, Hazel. Um, so what can I add to uh, what Paul said? Maybe I give you a little bit of information. We have just sort of 30 seconds, Egon. Yeah. So oh, it has yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Paul is an assistant professor of mathematics and computer science at Northeastern with a joint appointment in the math department in Quarry College. He received his PhD at New York University and was a winner of the court <clears throat> Fernix Prize for Outstanding Dissertation in Mathematics at NYU. Then he was a postdoc at NYU Medical School for one year and four years at uh, MIT's math department as a postdoc. Then in 2014, he joined Rice University, the Department of Mathematical uh, of Computation and Applied Mathematics as an assistant professor. And we were lucky in 2018 to be able to recruit such a star researcher as Paul to Northeastern. And uh, he has very broad interests, as you just saw, and he's widely published in prominent mathematics journals and top machine learning conferences. And um, in recognition of his research, he has received several grant awards, including a prestigious NSF career award just a year ago. And he's also, as he mentioned briefly, a strong advocate for education. He has been closely associated in various capacities with the Tapia Center for Excellence and Equity at Rice Universities, including serving as its interim executive director for one year and leading STEM summer camps for high school students for several years. And uh, Professor Hans' wide range of activities is also reflected in numerous speaking engagements, including an oral presentation at the 2018 NIPS conference. NIPS means Neural Information Processing System Conference. We are, of course, very happy that in our is in our department. And after his talk, you probably would agree with me. Thank you so much, Professor Schulte. I, I delighted to have you wrap up. We clearly appreciated Professor Han's expertise through his clear and very important talk. And I really appreciate you wrapping up with a celebration of why we hired you, Paul, and why we are so delighted to have you here in the math department at Northeastern. I would like to thank you all very greatly for joining us today for this wonderful talk and for this wonderful series. We look forward to seeing you next time at the College of Science Connects seminar series. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.